people were passing us by and I was asking them to talk about their experience and they said, you know, one of the strange, you know, one of the difficult things about being homeless is that you're invisible. You know, how do you render something sort of poetic and lyrical um, that is also really harsh? Welcome to Eidos the Podcast, where we explore the ways in which ideas take their shape and form through the arts. This podcast is brought to you by eidosartworks.com, a website dedicated to bringing thought-provoking content that engages and inspires. And Spokane Falls Community College Photography and Digital Media Production Programs, preparing students for careers in applied visual arts since 1965. And the Richmond Art Collective, supporting artists in downtown Spokane with affordable studio spaces and a gallery located in the historic Richmond Hotel building. My name's Ira Gardner, and I teach photography and digital media production at Spokane Falls Community College. I also have a studio here at the Richmond Art Collective, and I'm your podcast host. So let's get started. <laughs> Can you just give us your, your name, rank, and serial number? No. <laughs> just right. an overview of, of who you are, what you do, and how you came to pick up the camera. So... Yes, Um, my name is Keith Livers. I'm a professor of Russian studies at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I teach Russian literature, 19th century, 20th century, and 21st century Russian culture and uh, Russian cinema also. Um, And I research on a number of different topics. The camera uh, I took up because uh, because I started, basically, I signed up for an, an intro to a photography course in 2008 um, at Flatbed Press, then Flatbed Press in Austin. It's now disappeared beneath condoni- condominiums. Um, and I did it just because I wanted to, um, I wanted to figure out how the camera works. I wanted to know, you know, what like f-stop was and shutter speed and all that stuff. And so I took that, uh, I took a class and, and uh, our teacher told us to bring an SLR film camera and some black and white film and that's what we were allowed to use and so i started taking photos um uh, that way but one of the things that she asked us to do which stumped me during the class i have to admit was to sort of articulate what it was i wanted to take photos of and i had absolutely no idea so i wrote nothing and uh it sort of got me thinking and i you know i took pictures of various things but um, at some point, I think a couple years after that, for various reasons, I um, sort of rediscovered my connection to Spokane, where I'm from, where I grew up, um, and where I had not been for many, many years. And the camera ended up being a way, um, uh, in a very powerful way, I think, for me to to reestablish this connect- connection that had been broken for for many years. I was, I mean, I started to go back, um, among other things, because I was having dreams about Spokane. And I would see places in my, in my dreams. And, uh, and it sort of kind of had this, they acquired a sort of mythological or mythical quality to them. And so I thought, look, I have to go back to this place. And I think, you know, the, the, you know, working or sort of going back and then thinking about how to photograph this place that I was rediscovering was uh, sort of the beginning and it was the beginning of this um of a more sort of serious engagement with photography originally it was just a question of finding places um locations that uh, kind of evoked the emotions i guess that i was feeling as a result of reconnecting but also that would that, that sort of would represent what i felt spokane had been like when I was when I was a kid growing up there. But did you find Spokane was still? I mean, you know, Thomas <coughs> Wolfe talks about you can never go home. Did you, yeah? What did you find going home after such a long uh, time, I mean, time of, away? Yeah, it's. I mean, one of the one of the um, sort of really wonderful things about Spokane. I mean, I, I mean, I, I really love Spokane, but one of the wonderful things about it is that it 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 has preserved a lot of what was there when I was a kid. Um, uh, so, you know, structures, um, streets, uh, just sort of physical locations that barely have changed since the 1970s when I was a kid there. And so, um, you know, that's 
you know, that's something you, you, in Austin, it just doesn't, it doesn't work that way. If you, if you were born in Austin, grew up here, um, it, it's, it's not the same Austin, but Spokane has, has still has that, um, has managed to preserve a lot of that, even though there's been quite a lot of change as well. And so um, part of what was magical and continues to be magical about Spokane for me is that I can time travel. I can go back, um, I can re-experience, you know, um, I can re-experience aspects of, of, uh, of, you know, childhood, of growing up, of, uh, of another time and place. Um, and there's still the sort of visual um, kind of, you know, stimuli that, 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 that make that possible. I mean, it really is kind of like, I guess, like time traveling in a way. But now, could you describe, though, like you initially were drawn to coming yeah. back to, to space and place and buildings. How yeah. did you end up with ending up with a portfolio of, of amazing poetic photographs of people? So, so what happened is as a result of, you know, as a result of scouting out these locations and going back to places that, um, that I remembered and trying to sort of evoke the sense of, of Spokane, uh, of my childhood, I started noticing the people. Um, I started noticing, you know, that, um, you know, the, the people that, the, the, the inhabitants of these places. Um, and one of the things, um, uh, one of the things that I'd noticed is just that 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 that, that part of Spokane had changed a lot, um, not always in the best ways, obviously. Um, uh, but I thought that was kind of interesting because I grew up in a in, in a in a in a part of Spokane that was, I would say, kind of it was lower middle class, but has since um, degraded. I would say a lot of it, not all of it, but um, but. In which neighborhood is that? So, um, uh, well, I mean, the last place we lived was, was the Garland district and that actually has, has, has uh, is now better, but, um, so lower Hilliard market in Euclid yeah. Yeah. That area. Um, uh, and well, Hilliard is kind of mixed now, but, but in any case, um, I just remember that it was, you know, it, it just was, it, it was sort of more kept up. Um, and, uh, and that has changed. And I think, you know, because, uh, because of economics and, and, and various larger shifts. But, um, but as a result of that, I became kind of interested um, in sort of photographing people. I mean, I, I thought, you know, um, it's an interesting, you know, I mean, this is where it becomes sort of political, but um, right, I mean, there's, the, there's this, this sort of larger issue um, that anyone anywhere in the United States um, can see. It's not a, it's not a secret of, 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 of extreme and growing income inequality. And in Spokane, um, it's very, very easy to see. Maybe because it's smaller, but you know, you go from South Hill to where, where I was taking photos and all of a sudden it's like two different worlds. It's like a tale of two cities, right? And so um, part of that then became, you know, this desire to sort of maybe sort of shine a spotlight on that, um, on, on this issue. That was certainly part of it. Another part, and this is the, the, the part that I would sort of describe as, as almost kind of utopian as just a desire to photograph that, that, that community, that part of Spokane, that I don't think is really seen that much um, or is seen and kind of disregarded. And, and um, I mean, I guess feeling a sort of solidarity with the, with the community that, that, um, that had been mine at one point um, is not now, but, but certainly was and, and, and wanting to, to, to sort of photograph that community. That's, a, that, that's, I say utopian just because it's, it's, a, it's something that would require, you know, breadth and long-term commitment and, and actually being there. Um, but it's definitely something that I think about every time I go there because I see, you know, like in the courts of like looking at, you know, going to various places in Spokane, I see, you know, hundreds of faces that I think would be interesting. You know, people who I don't think are, 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 are that represented, but um, whose lives are interesting and, and who's, you know, and who also sort of fit into, whose lives also fit into this larger issue of, of poverty, income inequality, and so on and so forth. So this was the first image that you uh, sent me. I mean, it's, it, to me, it's a pretty amazing story to think about the fact that um, we're connected via Facebook, but we didn't know each other in Spokane. Mm -hmm. turns out you're from Spokane and you've been photographing here for the last number of years. Um, and you shared some images with me that I just thought were absolute visual poetry um, and not your typical 
uh, social documentary photographs in that that tr tradition of say uh, uh, Walker Evans or uh, Diane Arbus, where um, y you can get a sense that there was an interaction between you and the and the uh, person that you're photographing. Um, could you describe what what it's like when you photograph people? Um. Uh, how to describe, uh, I'm not usually at a loss for words, um, but I don't usually have to talk about the process of, uh, photographing people. Um, I, honestly, I'm not sure that I can describe. I don't, Do you remember this photo? Do you remember this? I do remember. I remember, um, yeah, it's because you're asking what seems to be like a sort of meta question. And, and I do remember my interaction with this woman. Her name is Mary Helen. And she's a homeless person in Spokane who lives uh, under the, or who was living under the bridge near the Taco Time on 3rd. Um, and uh, I approached her um, and I asked her about, um, I was intrigued by her because she was standing next to uh, a great big um, dollhouse. Um, it was this, you know, like, I don't know, it was, it was a very large dollhouse and she also had a sock puppet. And I asked if that was her house and she said, yes, that was her house. Because people had, you know, sort of their accumulated belongings um, up under the bridge and that happened to be hers. And, and so um, I told her what I was doing um, and, uh, uh, and I asked if she would be interested in participating and so, and telling me something of her story, which she did. And it was an interesting story because, um, I mean, as I understand it, um, at some point she was living on the South Hill and she was living um, a, a, a very nice life, um, uh, but uh, divorce, um, mental health issues and so forth um, led to the situation where she, um, uh, became homeless and has probably, I mean, I think has been homeless for a number of years now. Um, and so uh, I just thought she was, um, you know, that it was, it was a great story because it, you know, it was a sort of not rags to riches, but riches to rags story, if you will. But um, she was just a very um, sort of warm, sort of charming person. Um, uh, although the next day when, when, when I came to visit, um, she was, uh, she was not all together. She was not all there. I think so mm -hmm. she was having some issues, but, um, and so well, we I just, think uh, I think what strikes me is how close you are with the camera, like how close immediate the camera is and that you had to build that rapport to, um, for her to allow you in. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, I think that's the, um, I mean, I do like to take, um, I mean, I, I do prefer to, to, to sort of approach subjects this way. I've noticed that a lot of times there is that sort of sense of closeness and, and, and rapport and how exactly that happens. I don't know. It doesn't happen with everyone, but in, uh, um, uh, obviously because some people, um, uh, some people let you in and other pe other times, you know, people uh, keep you at a distance, but, um, I mean, I think it's, you know, I, I, it's very hard for me to talk about exactly about what, what it feels like, except that I think that, you know, at some point as I'm behind the, the camera, what I'm, what I'm experiencing or, or, or feeling is a kind of commonality. Um, and I'm at the same time trying to, to sort of get, um, um, sort of, you know, burrow into um, who that, who that person is. And, and so, um, exactly how that works i don't know it's intuitive but um uh but yeah there are there are those um there there is often times that sense of uh, of um, i guess sort of a sort of an intense commonality between me and the subject and, and sometimes that you know sometimes it comes through um this is a photo of her that i like a, a lot um but i'm not exactly sure why um i guess because she just looks very reflective um, uh, not particularly happy. Um, her circumstances were, were, were obviously not happy ones, but, um, but it seemed to express something of, of her. So, 
Um, I think it's a, it's a powerful image. I, I really, I'm drawn to the fact that one eye is drooping a little bit more than another. Mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm drawn to just the, the, the textures uh, and just the, the fact that you're brought in so close, you were allowed in so close mm -hmm. uh, to make that image. And, and um, let's take a look at another one. Sure. Um, that one was, uh, that one was, that was harder in terms of my interaction with the subjects. They, um, honestly, uh, they, because um, that's John and Thule, um, and at the time they were a couple, but then a couple of days later they were not a couple anymore. But um, but uh, that one was harder because um, I mean I approached them as I usually did, um, and she was sort of confused and a little bit um, distraught, and so it took a while for her um, to calm down. In some ways, it was a bit disturbing because um, uh, because right before. Um, as in the process of calming down, they basically shot up. Um, I, I, I didn't really realize that this was such an issue, um, but I'm not surprised. Um, uh, there, there were drugs involved. And so once, uh, you know, once they had done that, um, they were both sort of more calm and there was this moment of intimacy. I honestly, uh, at the mo in, in the moment, I didn't know whether it was right to, to take the image or not. But uh, because it it did seem so intimate, but I decided that I would go ahead and you know take the shot anyway. I guess yeah, I was I was I was very happy with it because I mean um, one of the things that I that I would have been sort of you know trying to do or wanting to do with this uh, obviously you know is to you know on the uh, well obviously is to document um, this problem, but then you know but I want to do it in such a way that people see the sort of purely human aspect of the subject. So that it's not entirely, you know, it's, it's not just a photo of a, you know, say a homeless person putting up a tent or a homeless person brushing their teeth or whatever it is, but something that sort of transcends those categories that make, make it easy, perhaps, or easier for us to dismiss people and say, well, you know, this is a homeless person, um, or this is a person who's made bad choices. And so I think that's part of the reason for you know, sort of taking photos that are, are quite personal and sort of intimate um, the way this one was. Um, because I want people to see, you know, not just someone shooting up, which is what they were doing, you know, several minutes before, you, before that. But that there's a relationship. But that there's a relationship there, there's tenderness, there's closeness, you know, there are all of the emotions that, you know, that anyone else experiences. And then, you know, the next day, they were, they were, they were not together, but so there's that too, but, but there was that moment of extraordinary sort of tenderness that, that, you know, that, that, that speaks to anyone. <laughs> hmm. That's Alexis. Um, it's hard for me to talk about Alexis cause, um, uh, because, uh, uh, well, um, <laughs> If I, I'm actually not sure why it's it's because um, I thought that she was such a lovely subject. Um, she and her boy boyfriend both, but she was really great. I stopped to talk to her and her boyfriend, um, and I, it was actually by accident. I was looking for someone else. I was looking for a street performer that I'd seen the day before, and I said, "Well, I'm you know I'm looking for this person, and, and have you seen her?" And they said, "Well, you know, why are you asking?" and and I said, well, I'm, I'm, you know, trying to do, I'm working on this project that has to do with homelessness in, in Spokane. And they said, well, we're homeless. They are not homeless now, but they were at the time. And um, I was just sort of, you know, there, there are a lot of, it's, I think it's hard to talk about because it's just sort of a longer story. But um, one of the things that sort of struck me as I was photograph, as I was doing those photographs right there that you see, um, is that people were passing us by and I was asking them to talk about their experience. And they said, you know, one of the strange, you know, one of the difficult things about being homeless is that you're invisible. Um, people don't see you. And so people were passing by and uh, they were trying very hard to sort of, uh, I guess not, 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 not to see them. And so they were kind of not exactly lashing out, but making kind of snarky remarks um, at people who were walking by but as you know, and saying, you know, well, holograms or whatever it was that they called them, uh, meaning that they just were, were not 
were, were kind of like sort of zombies just passing by or that they weren't you know that they, they you know they you know i remember at one point alexis uh uh made you know made someone a compliment on something she was wearing and and the person just ignored her um and i think it's that point she she said oh yeah holograms but what was interesting about the the whole procedure is that i noticed that people were sort of looking askance at me as well like why are you taking photos of these people and there was a certain amount of disapproval and so i thought it is you know i had never really thought about what it means to be homeless what it means to be seen as someone who's you know part of uh, of this um, uh, community, but um, it sort of was being kind of deflected onto me as the person taking the photographs. Um, that there was you know there was a sort of a certain amount of displeasure um, that people were expressing, uh, and I thought that was interesting. And and uh, you know just sort of seeing that, experiencing that as the person uh, taking uh, taking the photos. But then also just you know I would ask them questions about Spokane and. I remember at one point Alexis said that she thought Spokane was haunted. And I thought, that's interesting. What do you mean by that? And, and she uh, talked about, uh, you know, I mean, essentially uh, about uh, haunting in, in the sense of being, people being haunted by their traumas, by traumas mm -hmm. that were sort of recycled over and over again. And I thought, you know, that is actually really an interesting um, kind of sort of sociological commentary, if you will, about, about Spokane and Spokane's problems. And so there were a lot of moments like that where, where in addition to, you know, sort of photographing them, we just had interesting conversation. And It sounds like an interesting metaphor for, for the whole idea of cycles of poverty. Yeah, no, and that's exactly what she, I mean, I think that's exactly what she was talking about. So. Well, and, and, and what I find interesting is this idea that, you know, a project that started from a very personal, even, even you know, intimate dream life mm -hmm. and connection to a place has turned into not just your individual biographical exploration, but rather a expose of a universal issue of humanity, universal issue of poverty, and that Spokane really can be representative, representative of that issue while at the same time have a very intimate feel to the work that you're making. It's a kind of, it's, it's, it's a bit, I'd say it, it ends up being in some ways kind of confusing to conceptualize or to, to sort of encompass because it really is, they're separate things or they, they seem sort of, they, they seem very sort of disparate to me, but, um, uh, and, and maybe there's a certain amount of tension there because like, how do you make something, you know, how do you render something sort of poetic and lyrical um, that is also really harsh in many ways, right? Um, uh, and that maybe is, is is the challenge of it. I mean, I um, I mean, I've I've told people that um, you know here about my experiences, and one of the things I told them, um, you know, sort of photographing the poverty aspect of it, is that you know that it, that, that um, like in in Austin, you see people with signs, right? The you know, anything helps or whatever. Right. There's no shortage of that. Any American city has that, but it's but in Spokane, I remember two summers ago. Um, driving, um, you know, up Post or whatever street it was up at North Spokane, and there was a, a couple with their two children, and one and uh, one of them was like four years old, and he was sort of standing there, throwing rocks at a at an, at an electric transformer, and the mom and dad were sitting on the side of the street. They were pretty shady characters, but the but the youngest kid was like a toddler in in in, um, in diapers, and and I just and they were you know they were basically panhandling, but I just thought you know that's what you don't see in Austin. Like that, you would never see. I thought, you know, that is really, or you know, like I mean, when I was uh, actually across from the um, from the, the the milk bottle store, um, I was just driving by, and I saw like a whole family there, and there's a kid, like he was nine or eight or whatever he was, and it had a sign that said "Need money to bury my dad," spelled with two R's, um, and I just thought that I don't see in Austin. Um, and so I think it is really actually a very, an extraordinarily sort of acute um, and serious problem that, that we, we definitely need to, to spend more time thinking about. But again, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's, it's also this question of like, then how do you combine the sort of lyrical, the poetic and, um, you know, and the social justice aspect of it? And I just have to say your, your academic pedigree in, in your career path seems to lend itself to that lens, doesn't it? I mean, you know, where does your, your life in Russian literature play mm -hmm. out into this photographic work? I'm teaching uh, uh, an intro to Russian literature right now. Um, so we go from the earliest texts to 
basically 1960s, I always end up having to kind of make a pitch for what I think is unique about Russian literature. Um, and there are many things that are unique about it, but um, but one of the things that uh, that you that you I think anyone um, you know who's interacted with the, with this literature and culture long enough um, uh, can see is its extraordinary kind of um, you know sort of intense sort of probing um, uh, preoccupation with the the plight of the, the little man. In fact, that's one of the sort of cliches about Russian nineteenth century writers is that they sort of take up the cause, you know, whether it's Gogol or Dostoevsky or Tolstoy, um, the cause of, of, of the, the oppressed, you know, the, the, the downtrodden um, uh, class and so forth. And, and that sort of attentiveness to hardship, economic hardship and uh, a difficulty, which, you know, is, is a result of, of Russian history. Um, uh, has definitely sort of inflected the way I see things. I mean, there's no question about it. Um, it would be, I think it would be strange if I, if in, in the back of my mind, I didn't have, you know, all of these incredible writers, whether it's, you know, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, or any number of, of 20th century writers that people know uh, less well, who have sort of portrayed um, these things in incredibly sensitive, you know, sort of evocative away so absolutely it's not like at first people you know like when i tell people that i'm doing this particularly people who are colleagues um uh they or actually subjects when i tell them what i do they the first thing is well, what's the connection and it's at first it's a little hard to to say well what i mean you know because it, it, it's not immediately obvious but when you think about it there is absolutely a very deep fundamental connection, I think, between them. Um, I was really sort of struck by how easy it is for people to fall through the cracks. Um, people who have uh, not really through any particular fault of their own, obviously they've made some bad choices, but as a result of, of, of many things have, have ended up in a, in a difficult spot um, and who then have to sort of negotiate their way out of that, out of that, uh, difficult place um but they were they were wonderful wonderful charming people but yeah. do you think the displeasure that was expressed towards you for making these photos is in part because the role the photographer takes of pointing something out and saying hey look at that yeah i mean th that's uh, that actually came out um uh, there was a summer the summer before uh my friend and i who's working with me on this um we're taking some photos of some people who are actually travelers. They're, they, um, some of them were from Spokane, but then a couple were from uh, Seattle area. Um, and uh, so we were, I mean, we just had stopped and they were performing for us. And, um, and so we were taking some photos and at some point a woman across the street, um, this is right across the, it was right uh, next to Mootsie's bar, if you know where that is. Mm -hmm, I do. Um, so right across the street, some woman started yelling at us and she said, well, you know, I really would, I wish you wouldn't take photos of these meth heads. Um, and they got really angry and I, I got sort of, um, I got sort of angry too. And I said, look, you know, first of all, they're not meth heads, they're travelers and, and that should be clear to you. But if it isn't, um, they're, they're not meth heads. And, and second of all, secondly, if you don't like the fact um, that uh, we're taking pictures of of, of this um, of these people um, who, in this case, were not meth heads. Then you know, or I mean, if we had been, then then do something about the problem. Um, but don't sort of you know don't don't um, don't blame the messenger. Don't shoot the messenger for pointing out something that, frankly, anyone who has spent time in Spokane can see. I mean, it's not. And it's not just meth heads. It's uh, you know, it's it's the problem of homelessness and poverty. Which, if you walk down, you know, if you walk um, around downtown Spokane after five o'clock on any you know any night, you see plenty of it. Um, and so it was kind of an interesting interaction in that she clearly wanted what she wanted from us um, was for for us to take pictures of the red wagon in, in, in Riverfront Park. Um, um, or Frank Steiner or whatever it is that people, you know, the sort of iconic um, Spokane landmarks that people photograph. And, and I thought, no, that's, it's not the story and it's not what I'm gonna photograph. And, and uh, yeah.
Well, um, it reminds me. But it was a bit. It was a bit like that. It was like, no, you're making. I mean, she said at that point, I forgot about this. She said, you know, you're making my city look bad. Um. Which, uh, yeah, I, I I totally disagree with that. But well, I I just have to interject that I think these are very poetic images, and that you're you're humanizing people that are so easily marginalized by labels. Mm-hmm. And uh, your experience with that person reminded me of there was a time when I spent a lot of time photographing um, cheap motels, if you mm-hmm. will. Mm-hmm. And I was having coffee and with some uh, friends, and I was lamenting the fact that one of the motels I had wanted to photograph had burned down the day before. Mm-hmm. And uh, was this in Spokane, by the way? This was in Spokane. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was one of the one of the several hotels that are up at uh, Sunset Boulevard and Government Way intersection there. Oh, of course, of course, yeah. And I just remember um, uh, it was actually a book club that I was in. And one of the people in the book club spoke, uh, spoke up and said, oh, good riddance. That was just a, a, a druggy motel. Mm-hmm. And, and I couldn't help but think, but what a sense of privilege that was. Because um, for me, what that motel represented was sometimes the only shelter that my, my um half brother and half sister might have enjoyed on any given night that that to me i think homelessness mental health issues um, addiction issues touch so many families uh and and that some of us are walking around uh, apparently middle class but in in actuality we i have not met somebody who didn't have a relative or some somebody that was important to them at some point struggle and so for me um, there was a period of time where I was estranged from my brother and mm-hmm. I knew that if it was a good night, he had a roof over his head mm-hmm. and, uh, and it wasn't, you know, for over 20 years, I lost track of him and I was just so grateful when I was finally able to. Mm-hmm. And when I got to hear the stories and hear how he survived, mm-hmm. um, it changes how you look at things. And so I, I you know, I'm drawn to this work out of uh, the way that it humanizes um, and forces us in some respect to connect to the rest of our, our brethren and sisters and uh, the rest of our community. Mm-hmm. You just sort of wandered up and said, well, will you take my photo? And I said, sure. Um, Th- that is such an important moment, isn't it? When somebody says they, they see a camera and they, mm-hmm. you know, will you take my photo? Mm-hmm. And, and I've had some of the most amazing experiences where people just are like, wow, you're showing an interest. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, I, it's, it's funny, like Spokane is a, Spokane is weird in that um, there's, for reasons that I think are, are clear enough, there's, there, there's that sort of um, reaction that you get from people. I mean, just a random person who's going to, you know, see me photographing and say, well, will you take my photograph? Which is which is amazing, but then um, other places um, that are also hard, you know, hard luck places. I'm, I'm not, I don't I, I don't reproach or blame people for a minute. Where you just you get the feeling that people are just like I mean, if they just see a camera, um, there's this sort of intense hostility um, and kind of paranoia and wariness. Um, the camera is associated with power. Yeah, and, and it's also and associated with the, the powers that be. It turns out because um, we, I mean, you know, uh, we would be wandering around felony flats, and and uh, and people, would, I think, they assumed that you know we're cops or something, which is obviously not true. But um, there was this woman um, in Spokane who was sleeping in an alley, um, and the alley is actually pretty well known because people go there to take these silly photos of I, I'm not sure what they do they, they, I know that people go there to take these uh, sort of gritty kind of urban photos oh the the high school senior portraits in the alley exactly <laughs> and, and there was you know exactly yes and everyone goes there. in fact someone was there yes yes um, but there was this girl who was sleeping um, uh, and uh, you know she was zonked out and I remember looking and thinking, is it right to take it? 
and I was I was sort of on the fence about it um, until I saw. I mean, the the, the figure, I mean, the the photograph actually wasn't all that wasn't what I really wanted um, for technical reasons, I guess. But afterwards, I looked at it and thought, no, it, there's there's a sort of poetry in this sleeping figure, um, and it was really about. Um, I, I think in some way it wasn't precisely about the intent, you know, the the, the desire to bring out something um, in that situation where people would see it, um, it would be moved by it in some way. Not that they would sort of look and say, oh, look, here's someone sleeping in an alley, but, um, uh, but it's one of, the, one of the difficulties, I think, of, that, of, of, of this, this whole venture, right? I mean, how do you, this is a very fine line. I mean, you don't, um, I mean, you really don't want to exploit people who are already marginalized. Right. And, and whose lives are already difficult, and 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 you know, um, it's one of the things actually that's that that's so well explored in in Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. I mean, mostly in the prose, right? Which is mm -hmm. you know, James Agee goes to enormous lengths um, to to sort of break down that kind of class um, barrier that 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 uh, or that that is sort of power differential. Um, that's one of the things that that that. Uh, that I think about actually when when I when I do this, but oh, this is this is um so <laughs> this is Rick, um who is the only person I met in Spokane. Uh, he lives uh, with several other guys in this house, um, and uh, he's the only person in Spokane that I met who quoted who was quoting Tolstoy to me but we stopped because he just had this incredible yard. I mean, it was like, there were like, there were like 20 cats roaming around. There are sunflowers growing. Um, there, it was, it was this, you know, this, just this incredibly sort of um, overgrown, strange environment with these kind of um, weird, sculptures that he made out of various things and he was wandering around out there and so um we just decided to to stop and and uh and, and chat with him and uh, uh and he talked about uh, Tolstoy's um death of Ivan Illich which I just thought was amazing because um because it's not so many people that you know you don't meet that many people who are going to who are going to talk to you about Russian literature especially since I teach Russian literature but uh but he was just this wonderful character who, um, I think in the 19, late 1970s, was a juggler, um, worked as a juggler in uh, Riverfront Park. Um, and so he was juggling for us. Um, and uh, at some point... Um, oh, wait, wait, wait. I, you might know this guy person. That used to juggle out in front of the parkade and uh, was, you know... Yeah, I, I I don't know. His name is Rick Rick um, Greeno, and he, I mean, he. I think he, well, there weren't he, that many jugglers in the seventies. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, I I imagine he probably was a sort of a, a kind of a, a, a very public figure and sort of a fixture. And he, yeah, he said he was he was a juggler, um, and so uh, he did some juggling for us. But mostly he, he mostly he was interacting with his cat which I thought was the funniest thing. And at some point he picked up the cat and the cat was on, an, on, on, on his hat. And I thought of Dr. Seuss. And, um, but he was just an incredibly lovely, um, thoughtful, uh, sort of uh, eccentric um, person who could have walked right out of Russian literature, honestly. Um, uh, so it wasn't surprising, I think, that he, was, uh, that he, he, um, he mentioned um, Tolstoy. Well, if you were looking for an image to represent Spokane of the 70s, I think you you found it here. That just has that feel to it. And, mm -hmm. you know, when I was a kid, you used to take the bus downtown every week for piano lessons, of all things, and wander around town. And there was always this juggler that was always performing and um, right there in front of the parkade, right by Riverfront Park. It might, it might well have been Rick. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. Been, yeah, he was he was incredible. So this image, are you familiar with uh, Eugene at Jay's work in, in France? Um, I have to say that I'm not, since it's, you know, I mean, you already uh, know this, have, have, 
I don't, I know very little about these things because it's not my, um, it's not my field. So I'm absolutely not. I mean, some of the names I know that. Well, at J is credited with making over 10,000 glass plate negatives in, in and around Paris. Mm -hmm. And, um, and your work has a certain quality that reminds me of his, his best work. And at J is credited with, kind of beginning the social documentary trend that led to French humanist photography that mm -hmm. came over to the United States. And we saw with the uh, Farm Service Administration photographs during the Great Depression and Walker Evans. And there's always this comparison and contrast between at Jay's uh, photographs of poverty in Paris versus Walker Evans photographs in uh, photographing poverty in the United States. And talking about that there was a poverty of economics, but not a poverty of culture. Mm -hmm. And that his photographs, at Jay's photographs of Paris, celebrated life mm -hmm. in a way that American images of poverty uh, do not as much. Mm -hmm. And so there's something joyful about this expression uh, mm -hmm. as she's performing, the street performer and traveler that, um, is is charming to me if you if you're familiar with no i mean i when you say that uh, that um it just i really am not familiar with that yeah i'm glad you brought it up because it's it, i mean it's very interesting to me um but that's exactly what what i really liked about the interaction with her is that there was this sense of you know there was just was this sense of extraordinary joy and i was wondering well is it is it going to be possible for me to capture that somehow um and um uh, and it, it did work out. Um, well, and I think what uh, what I'm trying to do is maybe situate or contextualize for anybody that's looking at this work that what's interesting to me is is it's got a little bit of that at J celebration. It's got a little bit of that Walker Evans of mm -hmm. exploration of um, disparity and in, in classism and culture. Mm -hmm. um, and it also has a little bit of that Diane Arbus sort of making note of the underrepresented in culture the mm -hmm. the unseen. And, and so um, all those seem to exist in here and yet they, you have your own poetry and, and the imagery and your own um, distinctive way of approaching these subjects. Um, now, is this work in Spokane or is this now in no, Austin? This is, this is in Austin. So okay. um, uh, it was a few months ago. Um, and it's interesting that you bring up the issue of you know being seen and not seen because this um, uh, so these are uh, so this is um, Rosie um, the woman and Butters is the the fellow um, and he's a traveler he was just passing through he's from Oklahoma City I think um, so uh, I never saw him again but uh, but he didn't want to be photographed um, and. Uh, I said, well, I think you might, I mean, you, you might actually like the, the, the end result. And, and um, the people that he was with did want to be photographed. And we're actually still working with, um, uh, with some of the travelers who are still, st who are still here. Um, and so he, um, because he didn't want to be photographed, he put his hand over his face. Um, and that's why, he, that, that's why you see, that's why it looks like that. He just, he, he thought, well, I don't want to be seen, but then he kind of did want to be seen. And then at some point, Rosie was there, and I don't know why she did that. Um, she just I thought it was funny that he had his hand over his face, so she put his hand over his, her hand over his hand. Um, and, and, uh, and I took the shot because I thought it was an odd, it was just an odd image. I, was, I remember I was looking... Powerful image in my it was, mind. It was supposed to be just like a group portrait. Um, the person, uh, the friend of mine that, I was, that I'm working with in Austin just wanted a group portrait of them. And, and so, uh, so she had them lined up and, and I was standing in the background and, and at some point this happened and I thought, oh, that's a really interesting image. And it's just sort of interesting the way he's trying to avoid being seen. But then he ends up being, you know, his, his eye is just so kind of intensely kind of penetrating um, and it just ended up being a, a nice image. It, it, it's a powerful image. I mean, I feel like I could write essays uh, about that image just because it's there's so much going on there. You've you've got the um, he looks youthful and and almost a sense of of innocence being protected. 
the curly hair and then uh rosie almost takes on a madonna figure or you know a very motherly protective mm -hmm. figure to it and and is just a very very uh i think the gift of the gesture even though it was intended to block or obstruct mm -hmm. actually really was a gift for that image yeah no it ends up bringing out much more than yeah i mean you're absolutely right it, like it, it was totally fortuitous but um and uh, and that clearly was not his in intention, and I don't know what hers was, but uh, it didn't. And I think hands it. tell stories. Yeah, no, for sure. And I've always been actually interested in hands, and so I was happy that they um, that their hands were so you know so in the forefront of of the image. Well, this one finally came up, uh, and you're right. And I actually uh, I'm a part of the Richmond Art Collective, and there's a group of artists, and and one of them is a, a very talented millennial artist who talks about film is his playground. Like he's mm -hmm. had precise digital his whole life. Mm -hmm. And for him to be able to play in the dark room and shoot and, and develop film and work with film is just pure joy and pleasure. And, I, and there's been a real renaissance in film-based photography. Yeah. And I have to admit, I was, I was with a, a, a group of students photographing downtown a couple of weeks ago and the night before, I thought, well, my, my digital camera battery's kind of getting low. I probably should charge it up. But, you know, I've got that film camera I've been meaning to use. Maybe it'll serve me good to let, let the battery go dead. Mm -hmm. So I kind of, like, did what you're not supposed to do, which is didn't show up with prepared with a camera with a full battery. Mm -hmm. uh, and sure enough, two shots in, the battery died. The camera's, you know, might as well be a boat anchor at that point. And I pulled out this little camera this little uh minolta hymatic in fact um this little minolta hymatic um rangefinder 35 millimeter camera it's like tiny mm -hmm. and it was so liberating i made photos i never would have made otherwise and and so like you i'm trying to get back into more film-based photography because there is something so f liberating about it uh, there's something uh, for me i mean i don't know i'm i have to admit that you know since i'm you know I, I just don't know that much about it, so I don't develop my own stuff. Um, so the film photos that I do are either they're hybrids, right? They're scans of they're digital scans of, of of film, but but still there seems to be there's a quality to the film that I just like. Um, there is even given that it's that it's hybrid at this point. Um, that uh, yeah, I I just it's it's kind of difficult to quantify what that is, but. Uh, but I definitely enjoy, uh, I enjoy using it, um, even though it is, it is actually kind of a pain. Well, point. next, next time you're in Spokane, um, and shooting film, you'll have to come into my dark room and we'll, we'll process okay. it together. And that will be in July. So. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, love the storytelling quality of a uh, man's best friend. Uh, yeah. That was Tigger and Turd. The dog's name, unfortunately, <laughs> is Turd. <laughs> um, but his, his middle name is Jello Biafra, so I guess it kind of makes up for it. But that, yeah. A term yeah. of endearment. Yes, they were, they were just sharing a moment together. Well, what I enjoy about your work, though, is, is, is it doesn't seem to... It, it seems to humanize and it seems to connect and, and bring out a, a sense of the universal condition of, of the human experience mm -hmm. um, or the human condition. It may be the more cliche way of saying it, but I mean, there's, it doesn't seem like it's the work isn't condemning as much mm -hmm. as honoring. I think that in order for us to um, really get at this problem, the first thing that has to happen is we have to be able to see beyond categories, right? Mm -hmm. We have to, you know, we have to, we, we can't just say, well, that's a homeless person, or this is a person who's made bad choices, which is obvious, which is obvious, right? But, but the, it's those, you know, conceptual um, sort of blinders that make it very difficult then for us to be indifferent. And so part of it, um, intentional, or maybe sort of intuitive is to bring out the universal, the human, or, you know, to, to sort of, to, to show people a face that they can connect to and that they find compelling. Because as soon as they do, um, that becomes the first, you know, that's like the first step to sort of abandoning those, um, you know, those, the, those boundaries that, that make us indifferent, that make us, you know, just sort of walk by or drive by or not see people that, um, that in many ways are, are, you know, 
just like us, who share same emotions and you know problems. I, I just uh, in my head, I'm hearing two f- well-known quotes. Um, the first is uh, by Paul Strand, who's known for photographing, among other things, he photographed a blind panhandler. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was some debate over, you know, whether or not that was an appropriate thing or not. And Paul Strand said that the spirit of the intent must be sufficiently humane to warrant the intrusion. Mm-hmm. And, and I think you've demonstrated that with your work and the, the fact that you were getting up close, personal, and, and uh, where possible, um, able to... to get that openness that that softness that tenderness that that occurs um, and then the second one that comes to mind is the african proverb of i am because we are and i think that's kind of the question that your work is asking us to consider mm-hmm. is that um, we we're in this together mm-hmm. well thank you so very much i um, i look forward to seeing an upcoming exhibit uh of the work here in Spokane. Uh, uh, things are in the works to make that happen this coming summer. So I uh, look forward when we get to, to meet in yeah. person and yeah. uh, look, look at the work together. It's, uh, yeah. um, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful project. I think it comes from a good, good place. So thank well, you. Thank so you. Much, Aaron. Thank you very much for, it was it's been a wonderful discussion. I've enjoyed it very much. <laughs>